everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Francophile Reader. So I finally got to the biography of Toussaint Louverture by Philippe Girard. So this is a book that I wanted to read in June, but I somehow underestimated how long it would take to go through all of my books for my qualifying exams. So I read a lot in June and July, but every single book was on my PhD reading list. But I'm really glad that I finally got to this book because I think this is a really solid biography of someone I didn't really know anything about. Um, so I often make videos on my channel on topics that I am familiar with. But Toussaint Louverture is someone I only know of from history and only very briefly. Sort of the heroic image of Toussaint Louverture, but I certainly didn't know anything about the politics of Haiti. And I chose this biography because I want to learn more about the history of countries that are former French colonies. Um, I do read literature by authors from these countries. For example, somewhat recently I read Jacques Roumain's novel Les Gouverneurs de la Rose. And Jacques Roumain is Haitian. It's a book that takes place in Haiti. I'll make a video about that at some point. It's, it's a really good novel. I don't know if there is a translation in English, but if there is, I will let you know. But I didn't really know about the history of Haiti, except of course that it was colonized and that Toussaint Louverture led the revolution for independence. This biography really presents Louverture as much more complicated than I expected. I expected that we would be talking about this really heroic figure who was always about emancipation and, you know, was really a revolutionary. He is a revolutionary and yet there were others who were much more like revolutionaries than Toussaint Louverture was. Louverture was always concerned about making compromises and making compromises with those in power, particularly what are known as the big whites. Those are the white plantation owners. And at times, his policies actually hurt the cause. Uh, for example, after he takes control of Haiti, essentially. Haiti is still not independent yet. But in practice, Toussaint Louverture becomes the face of Saint-Domingue. It wasn't called Haiti uh, at the time, it was called Saint-Domingue. He basically recreates the plantation structure. True, the former slaves are now essentially indentured servants, so they are being paid a wage. But it's recreating the plantation model, except this time you have black men who are the ones controlling the plantation. So there's things like this that really caught me off guard when I was reading this biography. I think also makes this biography valuable because I think we all have, to one degree or another, certain expectations about who Toussaint Louverture was, probably based on how we learned about him in history very briefly, I assume if you are, you know, if you're Haitian, maybe not, but for all, all, you know, anybody else, I think the history has been taught very poorly, if at all. Um, and we know that this was the first successful slave rebellion, that is usually how it's taught. But, you know, there, Toussaint Louverture is much more complicated. And perhaps that's the reason why he was so successful, is because he was willing to make those compromises. There's a passage in this book that I think really represents who Toussaint Louverture was. Here's what Girard says. Louverture's foray into the world of diplomacy in 1798 and 1799 underscored the complexity of a man who was a former slave, a father, a brother, a planter, and a diplomat. A master of the gray area and the white lie, he pursued multiple goals simultaneously and had to make morally ambiguous compromises to achieve them all. One of these goals was the defense of emancipation in Saint-Domingue. As long as that liberty could be reconciled with the economic recovery of the plantations. It was a delicate balancing act that would occupy him for the next two years, up until Haiti, or Saint-Domingue, gained independence from France. So Toussaint Louverture was a slave. He did have a lot more privilege, I mean, using the word privilege in air quotes, because it's always with respect to, like, black plantation slaves that we have to talk about privilege here. Toussaint Louverture was, was black, um, 
he wasn't mixed race, but he did have privileges that other black men uh, slaves didn't have. Most notably that he learned French, that he was baptized Catholic and therefore he got certain rights there. He, he got a lot of privileges along the way and actually he never was officially freed. Um, it's just that the owner, the, so the, he was part of the Breda plantation, the owner basically gave him his freedom but we don't have any paperwork to show that he, that manumission occurred. Manumission being the term for freeing slaves. You know, he was navigating basically the system that he was forced into and he really seems to navigate it fairly well for what he was given. Um, at one point his brother-in-law um, has this plantation and it's it's a coffee plantation and Toussaint Louverture runs it for him for a few years which means that he's owning slaves for a few years because a plantation of course comes with slaves and so you you, you see all of these morally ambiguous aspects of Toussaint Louverture but he will also buy slaves to free them okay so this is also the way in which he obtains the freedom of his family members there had always been slave revolts in Saint-Domingue. Of course there were. Um, and actually, two of his, there were these two uh, colleagues that he had, Biasu and I think his name was Jean-Francois. I will put their names on the screen. They were much more revolutionary than he was. I mean, they were going out and executing, um, well, murdering these big whites. And, you know, it was their way of taking back everything, getting their freedom, and also seizing control of Saint-Domingue. And initially, he's not interested in that. Initially, he's interested in being diplomatic. F talk of freedom is in the air, of course. And the colonialists in Saint-Domingue are using liberty and freedom as justification to not obey French authority. And actually, mainland France was actually more progressive when it came to the treatment of slaves than the colonialists themselves. And so they were saying, well, this is our property, we can do what we want with this property. The abolitionists in Saint-Domingue were insisting that they were good monarchists and that they were fighting for the king. Now, of course, this ceases to be very popular after the Louis XVI is executed, but they're claiming that they're monarchists and it's as monarchists that initially the revolution begins. And then some of them decide they're going to form alliances with Santo Domingo, hoping that that will then help undermine the colonialists. From being a monarchist initially, he is now uh, a good Republican. And so then he is fighting as a Republican. But then after the king is executed, they put this government in place. And it's this government that abolishes slavery. Um, so there are these two white Frenchmen who arrive in Saint-Domingue Saint, uh, Saint and actually are responsible for ultimately abolishing slavery in Saint-Domingue. His name was Sonconex, I think. Again, I'll put his name on the screen. And yet, he's not at all known for being the one who promoted this. Uh, Toussaint Louverture is very suspicious. He doesn't want to have very strong ties to France because if the politics changes, then black people could be re-enslaved. So he's always concerned, and I think rightfully so, that the tides might change and all the freedom that he fought for is undermined. But at the same time, he's not the only black man fighting for freedom. And like I said, there are others who are much more revolutionary than he. For example, there's this, um, the governor of Southern Saint-Domingue is also fighting for black liberation. There are, he leads two massacres to eliminate all of the allies of this Southern governor. 
So he's very Machiavellian, um, and he really has this idea that there needs to be a king, and he is going to be that king. He never fully wants to cut off from France because he still needs to maintain those alliances. But at the same time, like I said, he's kind of the leader of Saint-Domingue. He's the one who is making all of the um, negotiations with Britain and with the US. Um, there's a lot of politics here. I think this is one of the greatest strengths of this book is that it talks about all of the different alliances and enemies that Louverture is has having to navigate and how countries will play off conflicts with other countries so that they can get what they want. L'ouverture is also interesting to read today because he doesn't want to be seen as African. He doesn't want to be seen as black. He insists that he is European, that he is Catholic, that he is, you know, basically, he's constantly striving to be seen as the big whites. It's not the kind of black liberation that at least I hear about today. And I think it's really interesting to see, again, how he tries to ingratiate himself to those in power to a degree so that he can stay in power, so that he can get ahead. And this isn't, you know, this isn't to take away from his responsibility in leading the revolution because he did and like i said he you know he started to use the language of the french revolution to promote emancipation and he he does become a, a revolutionary but there are there are others and i think that's what's so fascinating to me there are others that were even more revolutionary than he who would never have wanted any kind of plantation system in place i came away with a really complicated image of toussaint louverture and i would be really interested in reading more, like there is a chapter at the end of this book that looks at his legacy, but be really interested in learning more about the legacy of Toussaint Louverture, how he has been memorialized by Haitians. And I think that's just as legitimate as talking about the history, like the real man behind the myth. Because I think that the myth, the hero, the legend is important too for its cultural significance for how Haitians today think about the revolution and think about what black liberation looks like for them today. The author Philippe Girard works more on the history of Haitian politics um, and also economics. There's a lot in here about the economics of slavery. It does bust myths about how profitable slavery was. That's propaganda that came from slave owners. Um, it wasn't as profitable because ultimately the French weren't fighting to keep Saint-Domingue. Uh, it wasn't that profitable. He talks also about how much, you know, how slaves were sold and how much like men and women and children and elderly people were sold for. It's, it's, it's sobering. I mean, it's, it's very harrowing to, to read this, but I think it's very interesting to think about how money plays a role in all of this, in the decisions that L'Ouverture makes, in the decisions that the big whites make, in the decisions that the different diplomats and commissioners from France, Spain, England, the US make. Money is the big player here, and it's kind of what determines how far the revolution goes and who gets rights. Girard argues that L'Ouverture wasn't always an advocate for universal emancipation, and in terms of male emancipation, okay. He seems to have wanted emancipation initially for black people who have had a more aristocratic uh, background or who were in certain conditions, so it wasn't universal. So again, I do, I'm interested in seeing how he is received today because I think it's really important on a um, historical level, cultural level, sociological level. Um, and also because every hero isn't really heroic or not always in the way that we expect. Um, I have a biography on Bernard of Clairvaux who was a 12th century Cistercian monk, very different. <laughs> um, and yet 
similar, very powerful person in his day. And that book is coming out, so I have an advanced review copy, and I know about Bernard of Clairvaux, um, and he is venerated as a Catholic saint, and yet he did some very unsaintly things. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's very valuable to understand the person behind the, the hero, but also to take seriously the hero and, and what that means for the people who venerate the hero. I thought this was a really great biography and I really do hope to learn more about Haitian history. Evidently, Girard has a book about Clinton's invasion of Haiti in 1994. I didn't even know this was a thing. So I hope to read that soon. In August, I won't be having any read-alongs because I have my qualifying exams in August, but I will come up with something for September. Thank you everybody for watching. I will talk to you later. Bye now.